inspiring conversations with the most compelling performers, educators, authors, and product manufacturers of our time. This is the show about all that's new and neat with clarinet, with the neatest people in the industry. Welcome to the Clarinet Podcast. Finding your place in the music world has always been challenging, but in the face of social media and all this other time that can be spent in all these other places, it's even more challenging than ever. Today, for part two of my conversation with James Zimmerman, we talk about some of our strategies for doing exactly this, and how some rather odd things, like Marie Kondo's KonMari method, have helped shape our musical path forward. Before we get started, I just want to ask to please excuse the audio quality of today's episode. This isn't something I have to say very often as I've gotten better at this. It's probably been at least 80 episodes since I had a problem. But since I talked to James over two days, I forgot to turn the levels back up, which resulted in a PEDCAC error, also known as Problem Exists Between Computer and Chair, also known as It's My Fault. Anyways, I hope you enjoy today's episode. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarneet Podcast at clarneet.com. If you'd like to listen to an extended ad-free version of today's episode and many others, head to clarinet.com slash subscribe. Don't forget to visit the Clarinet store for links to buy official apparel and special offers, products, and services, some of which are available exclusively to our listeners. And of course, I love to hear from listeners all over the world. If you'd like to get in touch with me or be a guest on the program, have a guest suggestion, or have feedback, just click on the contact button at our website. Again, that's clarinet.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show, and thank you especially to our sponsors for helping make it all possible. Join renowned clarinetist David Schifrin at the International Clarinet Celebration in beautiful Portland, Oregon, June 24th to 30th. Hosted by Chamber Music Northwest, this event combines a full week of concerts by world-class artists like Corrado Giuffredi and Jose Frank Biester. There's also clarinet masterclasses, lectures, clarinet mentors, amateur workshops, ensemble performance opportunities, a clarinet marketplace, and a young artist competition. Passes are on sale now, and you can learn more at cmnw.org. Have you wanted to try D'Addario reeds, but weren't quite sure which to choose? Here's how to decide. Reserve reeds come in a white and blue box. They feature a traditional blank and are perfect for those who want a focused sound with the quickest response possible. Reserve classic reeds come in a white and purple box. They feature a thicker blank that provides an expanded tonal color palette, clarity of articulation, and added flexibility. And the new Reserve Evolution reeds come in a white and yellow box. They feature our thickest blank and have a heavy spine for added projection and exceptional tonal depth, warmth, and flexibility. You'll have to try it to believe it. Try Reserve reeds now at your local music store or head to clarinet.com slash reeds to buy a box right now. Hosting for Clarinet is sponsored by Bakun and their new Vocalese mouthpiece. Complex resonance at a reasonable price. Get yours at www.bakunmusical.com and save 10% on any accessory purchase with code CLARENEAT at checkout. What do you make of all this uh, new technology and the new generation? Well, I think anytime there's a cultural shift that young musicians who aspire to have careers will adapt to what's popular. For example, audition culture is relatively recent. In fact, there was a guy named Ed Palenker. He's the former bass clarinetist of the Baltimore Symphony. He retired a few years ago. He recently made a comment on Clarinet Jobs' Facebook page about how when he auditioned for the Baltimore Symphony 50 years ago, it was in a hotel room, basically. You know, yeah. there was no audition, no screen, no committee. And that's how it was up until, you know, one generation ago. So then... The audition thing becomes popular and everyone adjusts to it. Music schools, music students, and you have this generation of people that masters the audition process. And now the next cultural shift is onto the internet. So you're having these young players master the skills necessary to become successful on social media and to build huge followings, which is a separate set of skills from making music. They're not totally separate, but there is this whole world of production and performance that is uniquely suited to Instagram. So you have a lot of these younger players like Laura Campbell, for example. Mm -hmm. She's a, a perfect example of somebody who is just a wizard on social media. Yeah, one of the and biggest she, followings. I think it's over 20,000 now, which is 10 times what Claire Neat has. And I think I have a large following. <laughs> 
Yeah, but um, she is just such a wizard with this stuff. And I follow Laura. I think her videos are adorable. And I think she's got a great personality. And she's very lovable. But um, I just think it's fascinating. You know, as the world around classical music shifts, everybody has to adapt. And one of the things that's really important to remember is that the social media algorithms reward persistence. They reward people who post regularly and they think, I guess the algorithms think that um, more content is good. So the algorithm rewards those people and then the it's like exponential the way that the followings grow. So in a way it rewards people who are persistent over people whose playing would have the level of quality necessary to be successful in auditions. Well, and I'm and not yet, sure. So sure. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm not so sure either. What's so great about, for example, Instagram stories. I, I've never found myself watching Instagram stories, um, Facebook stories too. I just, it's just something I feel like I finally don't understand as far as, um, my age group, <laughs> you know, Facebook stories are junk. Instagram yeah. stories. I actually have recently come around to thinking that they're pretty cool. Okay. You know, there are some people who want to put their day to day life in their story, but then they want to log their events as, you know, eternal posts in their, um, their collection of pictures and videos. So in a way, Instagram becomes like a catalog or an album of your work, whereas your story is just kind of your day-to-day life. Like, oh my gosh, look, I saw this thing while I was eating, or this is what I'm doing today. So Mm. social media is speeding up. It's faster and faster all the time. And the story has created um, this other niche for- It's just sort of less permanent in a way. Yeah, it's just ephemeral, you know, just goes away. It's so weird though to me, because like, for example, producing this podcast, you know, just doing the audio content and the editing and the releasing and the emails and everything that goes with it, it's almost a full-time job. And so I feel like if I have to delve into all this social media stuff too, I'm going to need a dedicated person to just do that. And um, it becomes its own content, which is kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, but you're producing something that's extremely meticulously made. It's open to a whole different type of scrutiny than an Instagram story. You know, people have expectations of long form content that they won't have of a, you know, one minute long Instagram video. Yeah. But, Piggybacking on what you just said, think of the preparation that goes into an orchestra concert where there's a hundred people on stage. The program is figured out two years in advance, typically. And yet that kind of entertainment now has to compete with the Instagram story for people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I feel kind of like the orchestra versus the Instagram right now, because, um, you know, for example, I've tried really hard and done a pretty good job, fairly good job of, uh, growing the clarinet audience. And I feel like everyone's very dedicated and is a great group of people, but it's not to the level of like, it's not that large number, you know? Um, but at the same time, maybe that's okay because the followers are all very niche and they expect that sort of content. But I guess it's a catch 22 because it's hard to grow your following on Instagram or something when the, the, the medium is not really that and you just don't have time. So how do you grow then? Is it, different kind of organic growth that doesn't require Instagram or do I need to put more effort into it or it's a tough thing. I think you just have to ask yourself the fundamental question. What is your goal in producing content? Mm -hmm. Do you want to amass a huge following or do you want to create something that you think is really good? Yeah. And that's the fundamental question that every musician should ask him or herself, especially clarinet players. Like, do I want to be a clarinet player so I can get a job or do I want to be a clarinet player because I love playing clarinet and it's not about the following. It's not about the money. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've struggled with the same thing, looking at some of the younger generation clarinet players who have 10 times as many followers as I do. But I think my content is 10 times more sophisticated. Mm. So do I let that bother me? No, because a piece of my content takes dozens of hours to create as does yours. And I well, think maybe it's different niches too, though. Like you're absolutely, it's a, it's a smaller niche, but they might be more intensely focused. And it's not really, I, I worry that someone's going to listen to this and go, Oh, they're being critical. But I think we're just analyzing two different niches and observing that they're obviously bigger sizes. Like there are more high school students playing clarinet with a casual interest that want to hear frozen covers. than there are people trying to prepare the, uh, you know, hardest orchestral excerpt in the repertoire and want to watch a one week long rehearsal video about it. 
Absolutely. So I try to reach people on in terms of depth instead of breadth is mm-hmm. how I how I answer that question. I well, make for content. those who follow me on Facebook, like my personal pages, um, which is almost I've almost maxed out the friend list now, which is really bizarre. So I don't know if people listen to the podcast and then add me instead of follow the show, but it's really weird. Um, but anyways, I'm always joking lately about this Marie Kondo book. Have you read this book? Yeah, well, I've been watching the Netflix series. It's fabulous. Uh, we yes. had the book before the Netflix series. It's incredible. I love well, it. I actually read the book and then I told my wife and she's like, oh, I've heard about that before. I'm like, well, let's do it. So we gutted our house. We got rid of so much stuff. And it's amazing because it, no, things can't even become messy now. And my, I feel like it's not just about like mess or, or tidiness. It's about the focus that comes from that. Because like when you have only the things that you need, those are the things that you're going to do and they're the things you care about. So you spend your time in them. So everything from my practice to my music listening to whatever has improved, but in a way it's affecting Claire Need as well, because I looked at what I was doing and uh, even before I had a blog, I had videos, I had, I was trying to have news. I was trying to do it all. And about six months ago, I was like, no, I just want to do the podcast really well. And I'm even shutting down the store, which I was running everything that's not drop shipped because it's just too much work and takes time away from the content. And, yep. uh, I'm finding myself so motivated. I get up at five in the morning to work on the podcast, you know? So yeah. it's uh it's a different mindset and it's like, I don't need to be everything. Maybe I don't need to be Mr. Instagram man too. You know, maybe the podcast is enough. And I think if you are creating content as you practice it and as you get better at it, you find your niche naturally. Yeah, like totally. I thought in the beginning of when I branched clarinet jobs out onto YouTube, uh, about 15 months ago that I would try to do a podcast. And then I said, you know what? That already exists, thinking of your podcast. It's like, I'm going to just focus on stuff that only I think I'm capable of doing. Like, that's never been done before. It's not trying to directly compete with anything. It's really just trying to blaze a new trail. And everything I've done since I got on to the YouTube side of things has sort of been experimental, Like I made this video about the Kansas City Symphony early on, which I thought was really fun to make. And I talked to all my friends who have gone through that orchestra. And it was an opportunity for me to learn to do some really good video editing because Mm -hmm. I was moving graphics all over the screen and sampling stuff from YouTube for funny little music clips and sound effects. And I needed a story where I could practice all that video editing and storytelling and that was a great opportunity and people loved that video even friends of mine who aren't clarinet players thought it was really funny and entertaining and then after that i said well what about commentary videos like there was that video that the london philharmonic put out about scheherazade which was shared on a facebook page with three hundred thousand likes and it got like eighty thousand views within a matter of a few days and all my friends started sending it to me because it was about the clarinet cadenza And it was played by this guy from the London Philharmonic, who's an absolute genius player and orator. It was beautiful. But I disagreed with some of the advice in there. So I just put up a video about commentary. And that really had a huge reach. It got picked up by Slip Disc, Norman Lebrecht's blog. And I thought, well, that was an interesting experiment where it has nothing to do with playing or rehearsing. Or I didn't even say what my name was in the video. I just kind of launched straight into the commentary and just seeing how people react and what people are interested in, what type of content people want is part of the content creation process. You know, finding your audience, finding what works, finding what outrages people. And then when you go on to make your next piece of content, you have a little bit more of a codified game plan for what you want to do. You know, I just had my first slip disc share too. And uh, it was a huge traffic spike and, and got, you know, a lot of attention and it was but it was so interesting to me because um you know all this other content over the years that i've been producing and uh i've even sent things into him before like hey you know would you consider featuring this and this one really just caught his eye i guess because it was an interesting uh entertaining episode you know and um was it that one that you did with stanley drucker yeah exactly exactly yeah super so, interesting you know there's another example of a great website that's doing its niche thing really well all he does is classical music news and he shares all other people's, you know, what's going on. And there's no video blog. There's no podcast. As far as I can tell, there's no Instagram channel. Like, and it gets, I think it's over a million uh, page views a month. Yeah. So um, it's crazy. And so, yeah, if you really niche down, they say the niche can never get too small. <laughs> there's always a more intense group of people interested. And I, in a way, I kind of disagree with that. But um, I mean, if you want to make a niche about, 
you know, clarinet players who are huge fans of Brad Pitt movies that like to eat marshmallows while watching them. That's going to be maybe too small of a niche, <laughs> you know, but um, the, the general, you know, fundamental idea, though, is true. Like the smaller the niche, the more intense the interest of the smaller niche. Um, yeah. And for clarinet jobs, the niche has always been the professional side of things. You notice I never talk about equipment. I don't usually talk about practice techniques or repertoire that I like. It's all pertaining to the professional side of things. It's not for the general user that, like you said earlier, is a high school player who just plays casually and wants to have fun. Well, and that's what I tried to set up with clarinet too. And you, you show great restraint, by the way, by not talking about equipment. Because I found one of the frustrating things about starting clarinet at the beginning especially was, and I think some people fell off because of this, but um, most of the listener questions at the beginning, for example, for someone like Martin Frost, who it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity to chat with him. Yeah. Um, but I'd, I'd say 50 to 80 or sorry, 50 to 60% of the questions were like, what kind of ligature does he use? And it's like, I'm not going to get one of the world's greatest clarinet players on and just ask him what kind of ligature he uses. Like, I'd really love to have a more meaningful discussion than that because I happen to know that what ligature he uses doesn't matter. But that's not something that inexperienced players realize is that equipment for professionals and especially people at Martin Frost's level, they're not really bogged down in that kind of conversation anymore. You know, they really outgrown that. Either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, at that point they can just pick up anything and sound like they sound. So yeah, I've never tried to get too deep into those conversations. That's what the clarinet B board is for. Yeah. And I say that only snidely just to be Lovingly, funny. I mean, yeah. that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that niche is there for the yeah. clarinet B board. And again, I'm not trying to really overpower anybody or put anybody down. I'm just trying to, you know, nurture this one niche that I think really has a lot of interest. And there's a ton of information surrounding that one topic of like, how do I do this for my profession? I love that. And that's totally, I think, the point for everyone is even if you're not looking to create online content, which we kind of focused on today, you're just looking to focus on creating a musical impact. It's the exact same thing. You want to start a new a new uh, quartet and you want to get gigs, you're going to have to make your own niche. You can't take gigs from another quartet. It's not going to work. You're not that quartet. <laughs> and always something I think about with online content is the dichotomy between creating online content for a thing that happens offline. Mm -hmm. I don't think, like we said earlier, that clarinet playing stacks up that well on Instagram. Like now we have to compete with sports and entertainment and movies all in the same news feed yeah. where the best clarinet playing you'll ever hear will be in the room with the clarinet player. So that's why I've never really tried to just make recordings of myself playing the Brahms sonatas or take a picture of the orchestra and or the famous people that I play with all the time. I just don't think that kind of media is very interesting or unique. It's really a better venue for conversation, the internet than it is for performance. Well, you got to do what you're passionate about. I mean, if you don't really find it, that's your niche. Why force yourself into it? You know? Yeah. I love the Brahms quintet. I love playing in orchestras. I just don't think that recording them is really going to contribute much. Totally. Well, this has been a great conversation and you know, it reminds me actually um, our back and forth reminds me a little bit of the debate episodes, which were so popular early on in the podcast, which I've been meaning to bring back for quite some time. So um, I don't know, maybe James will have to have another debate episode in the future where you'll you'll be a co-host with me. That'd be great. That would be great, especially be on my fun. next trip up to Alberta. Yeah, yeah, you're up here. Trying to meet in person. <laughs> totally. So actually, that's a great segue into my next question, which... Um, so you came up to Alberta this summer and we weren't able to meet. That's where I live. Um, but we weren't able to meet because uh, my wife was having a baby literally that week and uh, maybe the week before. But either way, it was pretty recent. Um, and I was wondering if you would be willing to share because you're a more experienced parent than I. But do you have any advice for parenting while trying to maintain a music career at the same time? Yeah. So kids change everything. I have three children, three daughters that are all under 10 years old. So what I tell my students is, you know, the practicing that you do in your early 20s, this is the practicing that you're going to do for the rest of your life. Um, I found that I've just become a lot more efficient as I've gotten older. Like I can get my A plus playing with a lot less practicing than I used to be able to do. Mm. But I think this is really different for men 
and women, because let's face it, at least in my experience, having had children with two different women, um, my wife in either case has just done so much more than I have just out of necessity, out of biology. And that's not to say I haven't done anything because I've spent my share of sleepless nights and napping with kids and all this, but it is just a totally different thing. I actually saw somebody is going to present at ICA this year about making the transition from motherhood back into clarinet playing. And I think that is going to be spectacular that somebody is really going to get their mind wrapped around that and present their findings to the community because that's a conversation that people should really be having. I need to check out who that is and have them on the podcast. That's uh, obviously of interest to me right now, except I'm not a mother. (laughs) Yeah. But advice for people. I mean, I think having children has enhanced my playing. Mm -hmm. It's enhanced my humanity and it's taught me things that I don't think could have been learned any other way. So it's a double-edged sword. You get a whole new depth of emotion and understanding and love, but you get a lot less time in the practice room. So I'm just thankful that I put in my, you know, two or three years of eight hours a day, six days a week when I was in my mid twenties, because I just don't have that in me anymore, but I don't need that anymore. Well, it's so funny you say that because I found pretty much the exact same thing. And and I was quite honestly nervous because I'd heard a lot of conversation from, from, uh, you know, some people who were like, Oh, once you have kids, you'll have no time again and whatever. Um, but I find that the time I do have is used about a hundred times more efficiently than before. So I don't know what it is, but I have way less time, but I'm getting way more done, if that makes any sense. And, um, I think it does make sense. And I I do think that the perspective shift has been really interesting and, um, it's just been a really interesting journey so far. And, um, I, I do feel bad for a lot of musicians, I think, delay or choose not to have children because they're afraid of the time that they think that they'll lose. They don't understand how you just make things work. Yeah, I I agree. You start to just cast things aside that don't matter because now you have something in your life that matters a lot more than any of those distractions. (laughs) Absolutely. She is really, um, it's a really relevant thing what she's doing right now as the, uh, as culture evolves. She's a great figure. I've been following on your personal Instagram that you've been doing the, the, what is the, how do you pronounce it? Conmodo? Uh, um, Con Marie, I think. Is that Con called? Marie method. Yeah, it's great. It's, well, she um, calls it condo method, but we, we, we being my wife and I, we call it the Con Marie and we just say we like, we're going to Con Marie the living room. <laughs> <or whatever. laughs> it's a verb. Yeah, exactly. And it's just kind of funny. And uh, I keep joking that the last thing I'm going to Con Marie is my read box, which has hundreds of unused reads and used reads in it. And um, I keep joking that, when I finish, it will just be empty. So I might as well just toss them all. <laughs> yeah. None of the reads spark joy. <laughs> yeah. That does this read spark joy. When you start asking yourself that question, when you get it out of the box, you know, you're fully converted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think it's great that people are starting to have those conversations because another thing about being a musician, especially an orchestral one, it's not a, that family friendly of a, profession from a scheduling standpoint, because you're Mm -hmm. gone at night a lot, your schedule is erratic, it can involve traveling. So like many professions, it has its share of challenges. And you also need time to um, study and meditate over music, you need, you need to make noise when you work. That's another thing. If you have a small kid in the house that's trying to sleep, you know, your clarinet playing is loud. So a lot of people don't have the dwellings to accommodate that situation. But you know, chances are, if you're a successful musician, you are very wise and creative and flexible. So, you know, you can, you put all those things to good use when you become a parent. Yeah, totally. It reminds me of, uh, I think the St. Lawrence String Quartet came to my university when I was there um, doing my undergrad. And uh, one of the students, it might even been a student from like the community or the orchestra who happened to be there or something, but they said, uh, how much a day do you practice to be this good? And the guy sort of said, did most of my practicing in the 20, when I was in my twenties, um, you know, now I'm in my forties and I, I have a lot of those underlying principles. It's, it's more like maintenance and maintenance practice and trying to achieve musical goals with my technique. I thought that was really interesting. Yep. That's very true. It's another misconception that you have to keep practicing eight hours a day for your whole life. It, your practice regimen changes as you get older and, now that I'm in my late 30s, you know, physically, things don't feel the same. 
as they used to. You know, it's it's all downhill from here, man. It's seriously <laughs> no joke. Yeah. Playing an instrument is hard on your body, and clarinet is, but it's nothing like the violin or the double bass or, you know, it's just you got to be careful with all that stuff. So your practicing has to evolve along with you as a person. Thanks, James. This was such a, a great conversation. I think we had such a fun dynamic going, and I really uh, hope that people check out your clarinetjobs.com website, the Clarinet Jobs Facebook group, of course, where it all started, and also the newest endeavor on YouTube. So thanks so much for coming on the show, and I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Sean. Thank you so much for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, I'd appreciate it if you'd subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you happen to listen to your podcasts. You can also check out the website at clarinet.com for over 100 hours of free audio content with the world's greatest clarinet players, manufacturers, and more. If you loved what you heard, I'd love it if you'd support the podcast for as little as $1 per month. As a thank you, you'll get access to extended versions of many episodes, bonus content, and more. Don't forget to check out D'Addario's line of Reserve, Reserve Classic, and new Reserve Evolution reads. You can head to your local music store or to clarinet.com slash reads to buy a box right now. The show is also brought to you by Chamber Music Northwest. With over $20,000 in prizes and world-class guest artists and vendors, their upcoming clarinet celebration and competition is an event that you don't want to miss. Learn more at cmnw.org. Hosting for Clarinet is sponsored by Bakun and their new Vocalese mouthpiece, Complex Resonance at a Reasonable Price. Get yours at www.bakunmusical.com and save 10% on any accessory purchase with code Clarinet at checkout. That's all for now. Be sure to tune in next time for more of what's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry on the Clarinet Podcast.